Star Trek Discovery has entered its third year, and it begins where it left off from Season 2. Michael Burnham as the Red Angel uses the time-traveling suit to open a wormhole to lead herself and the USS Discovery far into the future in order to take the sphere data out of the timeline and preserve the future. Welcome everyone to Killer TV Reviews, and we are going to take a look at the first episode of Star Trek Discovery Season 3, entitled That Hope Is You Part 1. We'll go over what happened in the episode and afterwards give you our list of killer awesome things that we liked about it and killer awful things we didn't like. Please note that this review will include spoilers, so you might want to stop now and come back after watching the episode. It's 900 years later, and we are introduced to a man who wakes up at 0800 hours, takes care of personal hygiene, and goes to work at a desk carrying a box with the Starfleet logo on it. His duty is to search for a signal. What kind of signal? That we don't know yet. Now this may all sound mundane, and it is, but there is a point and reason why we are being introduced to this at the very beginning. Meanwhile, in the midst of a junkyard in space, we see a chase scene between two ships that are shooting at each other. The one being chased is Cleveland Booker, who goes by the name of Book. His pursuer accuses him of stealing, but Book states that what he has belongs to itself. The wormhole from the past opens up, and Michael Burnham shoots out and crashes against Book's ship, damaging it and the suit. Both Burnham and the ship crash on the nearby planet with Michael regaining control over the suit to activate her impact shields and reverse thrusters just in time before impacting the surface. Michael grabs her survival gear from the suit which contains her communicator, tricorder, badge, phaser, and emergency rations. She calls for the Discovery since it entered the wormhole right behind her, but there is no answer. She uses the suit's computer to find out that she's in the year 3188, near the end of the 32nd century. She has the computer scan for life forms and gets excited when the computer reports that multiple life forms have been detected, which means that Burnham was successful with her mission in saving all life in the future. Her celebration is short-lived though, when the computer announces that the wormhole is closing. Michael works fast to program the suit to enter the wormhole to send the last signal that Spock will be looking for and then self-destruct to prevent it from falling into the wrong hands. With the wormhole now closed, the reality of never being able to return to the home she once knew sinks in. Although she breaks down into tears, she fights to regain control over her emotions by reciting her name, rank, and serial number over and over. Normally, you see someone do this when they are captured by an enemy and not alone on an alien world. But there is a reason why the writers chose to put this in the script and it will pay off later. Michael sets off on foot in the direction of the ship that she hit and crashed as a result. Upon arrival, she meets Book and not on the best of terms. Book believes she is there to take his cargo and fights to take her down. Michael gets the upper hand in the fight explain that she's not trying to take anything and only wants help to find her ship. The Red Angel suit had an anchor point with the planet Terra Elysium, but Michael finds out from Book that she's on a completely different planet. Now lost, she begs Book to help her because she has no one else that she can trust. On board the ship, Book states that he's got to be somewhere by a certain time and his quantum slipstream drive won't work unless he can get more dilithium since what he had was damaged when Burnham crashed into his ship. Michael offers her tricorder, now considered an antique, and hopes that it will be enough money to trade for more dilithium. Michael and Book set off on foot to the mercantile where he'll be able to trade for the dilithium and she'll be able to use their transmitter to contact Discovery. During this walk, Michael learns from Book that the Federation is gone, collapsed over a century ago, sometime after an event called the Burn. The Burn involved the spontaneous explosion of most of the dilithium throughout the galaxy, destroying ships, taking lives, and making warp drive a rare commodity. They make it to the mercantile and are stopped by guards, who will not let Burnham through since she is not an authorized courier like Book is. 
After showing the antique equipment that Burnham is carrying, and Book knowing that the bosses are watching, they are allowed through. Book shows Burnham where the transmitter is, but it winds up being a double cross and Burnham is restrained for illegally entering a vault. Book takes her antique gear and leaves. Michael is interrogated by the Orion and Andorian, who I assume run the mercantile, since their hollow images could be seen when we first entered. We'll refer to them as the Overseers. They spray Michael with a truth serum, which results in Michael babbling out things that she knows are true, but in no way that makes any sense to the Overseers. Eventually, Michael spills the truth that she crashed into a ship carrying stolen cargo and named Book as the thief. Book, who is unsuccessful in trading the antiques for dilithium, is stopped by security and the overseers. Book and Burnham quickly set aside their differences and fight their way out of the situation and escape. Michael happens to see several pieces of dilithium ore, gathers them up, and she and Book transport away thanks to a personal transporter that Book has. However, they are not completely free from their pursuers just yet because they can trace his transporter signal. Security transports and chases after them. Every 30 seconds, the personal transporter is fully recharged and able to transport them to a new location. After several more transports, including one off a cliff, they materialize underwater, which Book explains can block the signal from being tracked. With a chance to now take a breather, Michael notices that she was actually shot, or rather grazed, in the arm. We learn something new about Book as we see him going into a type of prayer that summons a plant containing a gel that will help disinfect Michael's wound and allow it to heal. Book offers Michael access to his communication device to contact Discovery. Annoyed that Book had this all along and didn't tell her, she attempts to contact Discovery, but again, no response. Book comes to the conclusion that Michael is a time traveler. They make it back to Book's ship, but are ambushed as the mercantile security forces and overseers transport around Book and Burnham. They demand the security code to Book's ship at gunpoint. Book gives his code, and they open the ship to reveal the cargo, a transworm, which is on the endangered species list. The transworm detects danger and makes short work of the overseers and most of the security forces, with only a few transporting away. Michael gets consumed by the worm as well, but Book has the ability to tame and calm the worm who spits Michael back out. On their way to a place called Sanctuary, we learn a little about Book's past. He's from a family of poachers and killers who have practically disowned him for being the only one that was different. We also learn that the trans worms used to be everywhere until the Federation collapsed. Once they arrive to Sanctuary, the trans worm is released into the wild with other rescue trans worms, just in time for the breeding cycle. His delivery complete, Book says to Michael that he knows someone who might be able to help locate her ship. Book takes her to what used to be a Federation relay station, and this is where the man from the beginning lives and works on a daily basis. Now we get the payoff as he introduces himself as Starfleet. Michael gives her name, rank, ship, and serial number. She asks if he can locate the warp signature of her ship, but he is unable to find anything within the sector. Long-range sensors no longer work as a result of the burn, so he can't check any other sector. Michael explains that her ship was right behind her in the wormhole when they traveled from the past. However, based on temporal mechanics, Discovery could show up tomorrow, next week, next month, or not for even a thousand years. The man, who is a Federation liaison named Sahil, we learn has been watching over the station every day for the last 40 years, believing and hoping that one day, someone from the Federation would find him. He was never officially sworn in to the position because nobody has been around to do it, but he is what the people in this time call a true believer. And it appears Book is a true believer as well. He reveals the box with the Starfleet insignia that we saw at the beginning of the episode, and that it is the Federation banner that has been in his family for generations. Only a commissioned officer may raise it, and he has wanted to see it on the wall for a long time. 
Burnham gives him a field commission as an acting communications chief that can continue looking for the Discovery, and together they raise the banner of the Federation. Now that we've gone over the story, let's talk about 20 killer awesome things of this episode. Number one, there were some beautifully composed shots. Two of my favorites were both from the relay station. At the beginning, there is a well-designed scene with Sahil's bed in the center of the room, which repeats the shape of the room itself. The light from the left helps draw your eyes into the center. When I saw this, I knew I wasn't watching the same type of discovery from the previous seasons. The other scene was at the end, where we see the Federation banner hanging in the room. I love how the curve of the desk repeats the same curves found in the display room. You also have a sense of framing going on to keep your eyes on the most important focus, the Federation banner. The horizontal lights, vertical light, and desk help to draw out that frame in a pleasant way. Number 2. We get a little bit of Star Wars with the chase scene involving Book. It reminded me of the Rebels fleeing the Star Destroyer at the beginning of the original Star Wars, where they were shooting back at the Star Destroyer while trying to escape. There's also better and more interesting sound effects for the energy weapons being used compared to what we heard in the first two seasons, and they sound like they really belong here in the 32nd century. Number 3. I love the imagination that went into the technology of the 32nd century. 900 years after Pike and the Enterprise, and even years after the Temporal War, we need to see technology even more advanced. I was reminded of the movie Tron Legacy when seeing beds, desks, and even a box that could assemble and disassemble. It also reminded me of the replicators from Stargate SG-1. I also liked the view screen, which had a three-dimensional representation of the alien's head who was pursuing Book. And I liked the reaction of the control panel as Michael hovered her hand over it. Number 4. The music I felt was excellent. There were some bits that even reminded me of the soundtrack to Tron Legacy, and they felt very appropriate to those scenes. Number 5. Michael's Survival Pack. It looks more like a display case holding classic Discovery Era technology, and I think it would make a great collector's item if someone ever decides to make it. Number 6. The year 3188 sounds like a callback to Back to the Future, in which the time-traveling DeLorean had to reach 88 miles per hour in order to travel through time. Number 7. New images in the opening credits. I've always seen these as little hints on what we'll see in the current season. We see the Discovery Phaser, followed by what I assume is the 32nd Century Phaser, we also see a Federation robot, which reminds me of the robot from the animated Short Treks episode, Ephraim and Dot. We also see 32nd Century Starfleet badges that have their rank on them, with the same pips used since Star Trek The Next Generation. I also saw them as symbolism for a captain, first officer, and an ensign on a transporter pad getting ready for an away mission. Lastly, there is a slightly new logo for Star Trek Discovery, which I think is quite fitting since we are no longer in the same time period as before. Number 8. Book mentions that the nearest stable wormhole is 100 light years away. This sounds like a nod to Deep Space Nine and the Bajoran wormhole, which is still around in the 32nd century. I'm curious as to how the Bajorans are doing and the status of the Dominion, since there is still access to the Gamma Quadrant. Hopefully, We'll learn more in future episodes or seasons. Number 9. There are callbacks to Star Trek Voyager in regards to Book's Quantum Slipstream Drive and a passing comment that the Gorn had destroyed two light years of subspace. That had me thinking of the highly unstable Omega Particles, which also destroy subspace. It's also part of the anniversary event in the game Star Trek Online, where Q sends you around to stabilize blue, red, and yellow Omega Particles. Star Trek Online also has slipstream space travel. Number 10. The Mercantile Trade Center reminded me of Stardust City from Star Trek Picard. Although I wasn't a fan of Star Trek Picard, I did like seeing this callback to the show that we're still in the same timeline. Number 11. The comedy in the episode was pretty decent, 
and I liked it a lot more than what I've seen in the first two episodes of the animated Star Trek Lower Decks. Burnham was more likable in this episode too, especially when she was drugged by the truth serum. My favorite part was when she stated that Book was carrying something that was temperature sensitive and very valuable, and says that it has to be ice cream. Number 12. Book's cat, Grudge. He's pretty large, but I'm also thinking that his pet was also another animal that he rescued, especially since Grudge has a thyroid problem. Number 13. Personal Transporters. I would love to have one of those, and it's about time. Number 14. Seeing the return of classic alien races such as the Orions, Andorians, and Tellarites. We even get to see Illurian, which is the same race as Morn from Deep Space Nine, who ironically was also a courier who transported goods. I wonder if the Lurian here is a descendant of Morn. I've also heard there was a Cardassian that was briefly shown, and I believe it is this guy here. His ears are different, and he doesn't have hair, but the ridges on the top of his head and skull remind me of a Cardassian. Number 15. Transporter Skipping when Book and Burnham kept transporting to random places after every 30 seconds, it reminded me of the hyperspace skipping that Poe did in the Millennium Falcon on Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Number 16. Book's Connection with Nature 900 years is a long time, and it is nice to see someone have a connection like that with plants and animals. Although it seems a little like using the Force from Star Wars, I also remembered that Kess from Star Trek Voyager had a similar ability from the episode Cold Fire. She was also in touch with the very elements and building blocks of the universe in the episode The Gift. Number 17. A callback to Star Trek Enterprise when Book mentions the Temporal War and how all time travel technology was destroyed and banned. I think it also makes a nice nod to the game Star Trek Online which goes into greater detail about the Temporal Wars featuring time ships, equipment, the Temporal Cords, and a cool story about an alliance between many races to keep the timeline intact from those that would try to change it. It makes sense that all time travel equipment would be eventually destroyed, and maybe the burn is connected to it. Number 18. Book is a fantastic character from his first episode. I've learned enough about this character to really like him and desire to get to know him even more. The last time I felt this was with Christopher Pike in Season 2, who I thought Anson Mount did an excellent job portraying. Number 19. We didn't see the USS Discovery. Some may complain that we don't see the ship in the same manner as the first two episodes of Season 1. However, I think there is a lot more to the name of Discovery than just a ship. There is a lot that Michael Burnham had to discover in this new time. Technology she's never seen, a federation she believed in that has collapsed, and the real possibility that she may never see her friends again. And lastly, number 20. The beginning and ending scenes on the Federation relay station with Sahil act as bookends to the story featured in this episode. And it felt very much like Star Trek when they revealed the Federation banner and how it symbolized hope. I thought that was a much better representation than what we saw in Star Trek Picard. With all things that are awesome, there's always going to be things that are not. Let's go ahead and talk about the nine killer awful things in this episode that either I didn't like or that bothered me. Number one, I thought Michael Burnham was way too emotional. I felt she was way overexcited when she learned that there were multiple life forms in the 32nd century and that she succeeded in saving the future. Now don't get me wrong, getting excited is definitely an appropriate response, but I felt it just went a bit overboard, especially since Burnham was raised on Vulcan and taught to control her emotions. On the flip side, I thought she went overboard with the crying and despair. Again, a natural response when you discover that you can never go back home, but it just seems like a little too much. I do like how they show Burnham fighting to regain control by reciting her name, rank, and serial number, and sticking to the known logical fact of who she is. Also at first, I thought the scenes in which Burnham was loopy from the truth serum were a bit much, but I was okay with it the second time I watched the episode. Number 2. 
Book and Burnham walk all the way from his ship to the Mercantile Trade Center, when he had a personal transporter the whole time. Number 3. Valuable dilithium ore just sitting out in the open. If the ore is a rare commodity, then it should have been more secure, perhaps in the vault that Burnham was accused of entering earlier. Number 4. I didn't care too much for the reimagined Andorians. Either they are a lot uglier, or it was just this particular Andorian. The Orions still look the same, and the Lurians look pretty close to what Morn looked like. The Tellarites still look ugly, so I don't think it matters there. I sure hope they don't ruin Klingons again. Number 5. Mercantile security forces shoot about as well as stormtroopers in Star Wars, meaning not good at all, especially with those weapons they were using. How could you possibly miss? Now it's quite possible that this was on purpose so that it would trick Book and Burnham into leading them to his ship. However, Burnham was supposedly shot and I don't know how one of those weapons could just graze her without disintegrating her. That's like being shot at with a cannon or photon torpedo and receiving just a scratch. Number 6. Couldn't they think of another animal to use than a space worm? I would have preferred to see something a little more different instead of this current fascination of worms with the new Dune movie coming out. Also, the worm swallowing someone and then spitting them out seems a bit cliché and overused. Number 7. Book never explains why he didn't reveal he had a communicator that Burnham could have used to try to contact her ship. He could have explained that it was a matter of trust or fear that she was lying about contacting her ship. He just brushed it off instead. Number 8. This is just nitpicking, but I don't like how they have part 1 on this episode. By having that, it would mean that the next episode would be That Hope Is You Part 2. However, the title of the second episode was revealed to be Far From Home. Now there are some stories out there with multiple parts that have different titles, but even so, I would have been more accepting of the title had the second episode been Far From Home Part 2. If you're going to have Part 1 in your title, then be consistent and have the next episode labeled with a Part 2, whether the title is the same or not. And finally, number 9, is Michael Burnham really authorized to give a field commission? I didn't think she would be, but she is a commander. Commander Riker had the authority to officially promote Deanna Troy to the rank of commander in the Next Generation episode, Thine Own Self, so it makes sense. Still, it didn't feel authentic in this episode, and it certainly was unexpected. I would have had an easier time believing it if Saru had been the one to give a field commission to Sahil. All in all, I thought this was an excellent episode and quite possibly the best one that Discovery has had so far. I felt it really captured the sense of hope that the Federation stood for in a galaxy that has fallen into chaos. Out of five killer stars, I give this four and a half. It's not perfect, but it was a great beginning to the third season. Unlike Star Trek Picard and Lower Decks, Season 3 of Star Trek Discovery has left me craving to find out more about what's going to happen this season. We're now in an open playfield full of possibilities and new discoveries, and I'm hoping that things are looking up from here in the episodes and future seasons to come. If you enjoyed this review, then please show your support by leaving a like and sharing the video. Leave some comments on what you liked and disliked about the episode. Also, subscribing is an awesome thing because you'll get to be a part of our growing killer community. The notification bell will let you know when future reviews as well as other content are uploaded to the channel. Thanks so much for watching and have a killer awesome day.